In this video, we're going to be doing a deep dive on the manufacture and the hunting application of a 7,000 year old archaic stemmed Noonan point. Hi guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And on this channel, we do a lot of primitive build and hunting videos just like this one. So if you're new here, do please consider subscribing and following along. And today we are going to be going through a whole workup on the build, the hafting, and the hunting application of an archaic stemmed point, specifically Noonan style points from the southeast and more specifically in Florida, Central Florida. And so the Noonan style being a stemmed point from 3,000 to 7,000 years ago and also variations, slight variations of that point, the Marion, the Hillsboro, and even into later times the Hernando. So stick with us as we do a little flashback first to when this project first started a little bit over a year ago go through the hypothesis and then we're going to start working through some of our builds and then on to the hunts and what we came up with along the way. Hey Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive and this is kind of another Hunt Primitive cave talk and today we're actually talk about the Florida Noonan point which is probably my favorite Florida point thus far and uh, that's a middle archaic point about 3,000 to 7,000 years ago this was used uh, on the end of an atlatl and there's oh, lots of speculation as to how that these could have been hafted, but I've got a pretty interesting, and it seems kind of like a common sense theory uh, on how they were used. And this is a piece of Florida native river cane, and it's just one of my normal atlatl spears. And at one point I just kind of had this great idea with these little tangs because very, it's not very often that you see any sort of hafting uh, marks or grinding here maybe once in a while but it's it's very very rare and one of the other things is, is the archaeologists tell me it's not necessarily my specialty but uh, archaeologists that I talk to say that at uh, Noonan campsites they find a lot of the snapped off bases just the little square pieces laying around and that kind of tells me that they snap them off in the field and then they bring them back to camp and remove the pieces to put a new point in. And that also tells me if they have quite a few of those that there wasn't really any hafting. And so I kind of started thinking as to how I can implement uh, these points. Why would we start having a tanged point, like even a, a, a slightly tapered tanged point, like a Noonan or even a Marion, uh, and not have any sort of hafting notches anywhere around. And because this is kind of a Florida Georgia specific style of point, I started looking at some of the Georgia's Florida specific or even southeastern specific materials, river cane being one of them, and we've got some, some pretty good sized river cane. So what I ended up doing was I took a piece of this river cane, you'll be able to see here, it's actually flat. I heated it and squished it between two rocks, and if you work with river cane you know that when you heat it you can kind of manipulate it a little bit and it holds that shape. And so that's exactly what I did here. So I heated it and I squished it between two rocks and kind of worked a piece of rock in there to hollow it out. And by golly, if it didn't just fit a Noonan point just extremely well. So then of course I hafted below the point with sinew and I'll probably actually continue it down a little bit further to give it a little bit more reinforcement since this is an atletal dart or spear. Um, but what advantage this gives us uh, over, say, a, a point that's got, like a bowlin that's got notches in it that we can haft, or like a Dalton that's got an actual hafting area where this doesn't, is instead of implementing a four shaft system with this, we can inset it right into the end of the cane. And if we snap it off, or if we damage the point, or lose the point, we can bring it back to camp, heat it up, and it's held in with nothing but a pitch glue or a mastic and so all we do is come back to camp heat it up knock the broken piece out or it's already hollow it doesn't matter 
uh, put a little bit of new pitch on this and we can sit it right down in and put just a little bit of pitch right on the transition point to smooth it out and we're ready to hunt again and it's that simple and why this is important is so we don't have to wrap sinew, unwrap and wrap it again every time we want to replace a notched point and we're with four shaft technology you can have a bunch of four shafts that you carry around and stick down in the end of a spear but if you have this river cane it's already naturally hollow uh, now all we have to do is kind of carry around some of these points and then we just kind of get around camp at night whether you're on the move or back at back at your home um, all you have to do is have a fire and you just kind of heat these up basically you don't even heat over here you heat the rock itself and the the rock will melt the pitch back in here the heat transfers through and then you just pop it out pop a new one back in so uh, one of the things that i like about four shaft technology is i think that it, it's intentional to stop penetration so you can retain the point inside the animal and one another really important thing to mention is that these points are oftentimes really large they're not always re really large but a lot of them are very wide and some of them are very bull nosed and some of those may have also been used as socketed uh, hafted knives I, I really believe in that theory quite a bit but I also believe that they're intentionally left a little bull nosed and wide so they don't completely over penetrate through the animal so when they go in maybe they don't come out the other side the pitch breaks loose or the, or the base snaps off the spear comes out so we can now reuse the spear but the point remains in the animal and it runs off and when they collect the animal or even if they don't recover the animal at least they still have the spear but if they recover the animal then they can also get the point back out afterwards uh, and I think that that may be one of the reasons that they are maybe a little exceptionally wide and tend to oftentimes be bullnose. So, and then also remember 3,000 to 7,000 years ago, the megafauna is gone. So this is not uh, something that they were using to hunt mammoths or mastodons with or giant sloths or anything like that. Like all that stuff is extinct at this point. The only animals that are really alive uh, in that time period uh, would have been white-tailed deer and black bear. Those are going to be your biggest ones, and then perhaps maybe some elk on the uh, on the northern parts of Florida yet. And I'm not exactly positive on it, but I'm pretty sure the bison at this time has actually uh, moved back, and they're completely out of the Florida Georgia area. I'm not completely positive, so don't quote me on that. But it kind of makes sense then that the points can afford to be much wider and uh, afford to be a little bit more bull nose especially if really you're hunting deer if that's kind of your main staple at this time period in florida that you don't want to completely pass through the animal i mean you're probably not butthurt if, if you do pass through it because you killed the animal and that's fine but you designed it to where maybe it stops in a, in the animal about like this or or like this and then when it runs off we can recover the point later so i think it's a really interesting thought on these noonan points and of course all of this is nothing more than speculation from a primitive hunter which is myself and uh, you know of course I talk this over with Morgan Smith my uh, archaeology anthropologist buddy and he seems to like a lot of these ideas I come up with and he says yeah let's run with that and see what we, what we can do with it so I'm gonna mount this one up I'm gonna go ahead and put some pitch glue on it and uh, next time I have kind of a pig hanging around, a medium-sized pig that, that's kind of a, a good comparison to a, a deer, we're going to throw it into it and just to kind of see how it does. Make sure we do get the penetration that we're looking for before we take this point out and hunt. And then hopefully this fall coming up, maybe we, we can work up a situation. Maybe we can get in a situation where we can actually legally hunt a deer with a Noonan point right here in Florida. So hang with us and uh, we'll catch you on the next adventure. And so when we're talking about the construction of a lot of these Noonan or stem style archaic or even woodland points, there's a couple of things to kind of keep in mind that I've noticed during the building process. And that is that many times that we are seeing a little more flat side of one of these points and then another side is oftentimes more convex and I don't think that that's anything intentional it's just simply uh, coincidental in the way that we're making 
the point in itself. And the reason I think that is because instead of trying to reproduce that, I simply make the point as organically and naturally as I possibly can, and then compare that to the artifacts, but using different techniques along the way. And indirect percussion has shown me that we start to produce a lot of the same characteristics in our reproductions as we do the originals. And of course, you see, we start looking at a point like this that is a very, very finely made Noonan point made out of heat-treated coral. And it is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous point. And chances are this is more knife blade related and probably something, I don't necessarily like to use the word ceremonial, but it's probably something that was made with uh, artisanal quality in mind and probably didn't see a lot of use and probably was most certainly not thrown on the end of an atlatl spear given its size and its beauty. But when we make a solid white cast out of it, we can start seeing a lot of the flake scar patterns a lot more so than we can see in the original. And when we start comparing these very long flakes that happen, especially on the more convex side, is that is produced really well using indirect percussion with antler. And one thing to keep in mind is when you're using freehand direct percussion, that we tend to see these more large rounded flakes being removed where when we use the indirect percussion we're looking at very long and thin flakes not always but on i would say on the average we're looking at a lot longer thinner flakes that run to or past center and oftentimes in the build in itself using the indirect percussion when we don't apply enough force in the hit we do tend to see a lot of flakes running in and stopping at center or near near to center and creating a little hump turtle back on one side. Now how we end up making the flat side is when we're using a small uh, direct percussion antler billet and we're freehand swinging and we tend to run these very large flakes sectioning right off the bottom and we get a very flat cross section when we do that and that's apparent in the cast of an actual artifact and also in a cast of one of the points that I reproduced. And so again, not trying to reproduce necessarily the qualities we've seen in the artifact, but basically reproducing it naturally the best way that I know how, then we compare what I've made to the artifact. And if it doesn't add up, then we need to try to change some of the techniques um, that we're applying to the pieces that I'm making. So one thing that then I've noticed is, is when we start getting these very long flakes and this being one that you probably can't see because the camera just doesn't capture flaking very well, you just have to simply see these in person to really understand, is we start getting a lot of these longer flakes running across with a lot of really fine little edge work. And that's something that you see not only on mine, but you also see on the casts of the originals keeping in mind as well that mine has a fresh edge, sharpened, ready to hunt, where a lot of your artifacts are gonna be subject to slight erosion and also use. So they're probably not gonna have as fine of edge work uh, as a freshly made point. But we do see, especially on this cast, one where they do come in and we start to get a little turtle back, very slight, right in the middle on this side because we've terminated flakes with indirect percussion right in the center and it doesn't hurt anything on the point but it's just something to keep in mind because we do see the same exact tendencies on the artifacts themselves so that's very good indication that they probably were using a lot of indirect percussion and another really important reason that they are using indirect percussion is because when you start talking about doing on the inside edges of these tangs you can't direct percussion hit in these tight corners and if you simply use pressure flake to just push with an antler flake and break it out, these end up becoming very, very thick and very, very rounded, and they don't, the flakes don't run very far at all. But when you use indirect percussion, and you can very easily put a, an antler flaker of some sort right into this corner on a platform and then strike it with a mallet, then we can see these larger flakes, just like we see right here, but we're removing these big, very bulbous flakes out of these corners, and that cannot be done with pressure flaking alone. But by putting an antler 
uh, indirect percussion, either a compounded stick or a very long antler tine, we can then hit it with a mallet and we can drive these great big flakes out of these corners to start reproducing the exact same things that we're seeing in the artifacts themselves. So our kit for making these Noonan style or any sort of stemmed points is actually really simple. This is about all we truly need, one of, one of these or the other being an indirect percussion stick, this one being more of a, of a compound version, wood, wooden stick wrapped with sinew to be reinforced, inserted into it is an antler uh, flaking bit in which we can direct percuss onto the stick itself with a mallet and dry flakes off and if we don't use something like this we can achieve the same exact thing with this which is nothing but a very large deer antler tine and so this we can do everything we need to with the stick but it's not always super common or handy to have a very long antler tine and then a simple antler flaker uh, rather kind of a medium size or whatever and then a small one for edge work because it's easy to carry around and then this is going to be our freehand percussion billet that we do a lot of our mass reduction with and then of course this is what we are going to be using to remove a lot of our uh, flakes towards the end as well as the finishing uh, corner flakes along the stem in itself. So we do not need a very complex toolkit to make this style of point. And that probably lends itself well to the fact that we have peoples that are starting to rely more and more on agriculture at this point in time as opposed to hunting in itself. And so we have a, almost an oversimpling of the flint napping process within itself. So we're able to drive very good flakes across with nothing but this freehand billet and it's a very very small dense piece of antler it doesn't require hardly any weight to carry around it's a very very common piece and we can freehand these wonderfully long flakes all the way across sometimes completely across center and overshooting to the other side so that one went again to center Very, very basic tools, and we could take and brush a braid with the back of our normal antler flaker, and again, knock these wonderfully long flakes just freehand. Here we go. And so when we start watching and seeing how these flakes start to remove, we can see a lot of them running. You can see they're much wider flakes using the direct percussion. So you can see a very large flake here, a very large flake here, and that's very common to see in the direct percussion, and a lot of them going to center and sometimes past center. And then when we start building these larger platforms, then we can start running these very large flakes that will come in here, and they run almost across the entire face of the point. Of course it's facing down like this when we hit it. Beautiful flakes running right across center. Another really nice flake across center there. So it's probably one of, probably the most common technique as far as being very, very simple to remove flakes from the rock. There we go. Put it back on there. Very, very simple techniques and very, very effective just with a very small freehand billet.
very fast to remove this material. We do not need to spend a ridiculous amount of time on this. We can spend about five minutes tops simply rough bifacing out a spall. And if it breaks, it breaks. We'll grab a new one and we'll start all over again. But the, the important thing is, is we get a lot of the bifacial reduction done very, very fast with a freehand billet within just a few minutes before we even consider whether the point is going to actually make it to final production. And this is one of those situations where when you find a piece that looks very similar to this, this is one where we would consider this just a bifacial preform. And of course it does need a little bit more co cortex removed here. And this can be easily transported. We could create several of these to the point where we're now very confident we can get a point out of it or a blade and we can carry several of these for the same weight that we could carry one large spall and how this started. So we're going to biface out a lot of these and then carry these around and then as we need a new projectile point then we can sit down and start doing the final work with more freehand percussion but also the indirect percussion. Now of course we start getting closer to our our final shape we start noticing, so here's another great example, this great big beautiful flake that comes out, one of these wonderful flake scars from, but you can see how how much wider and more bulbous it is, and that's from the, the freehand direct percussion. And so as we start thinning out, here's another great example on this side. So we've got two actually wonderful examples, and both of these will probably be evident in the final point itself. And we've also started to just rough freehand out where our stem is going to be and we can't as you can see we can't get in very tight we can't create so some of your your other archaic points that haven't been finished with say indirect percussion you're going to start noticing these very gentle sloped edges that they're not necessarily a stem and they're probably set into a slightly notched shaft or potentially even a hollowed shaft or just simply not finished at all whatsoever because again this is a great stage in which you can freehand a few of these out start getting the basic shape and now we can actually just travel with many of these even if you wanted to take it down from the preform state get all your direct percussion done ready to go but not yet have your indirect percussion ready. So if we go to a quarry, we don't have to bring all of our indirect percussion tools. We could simply carry a small spalling hammer and also a tool like this and maybe a flaker for brushing or abrading the edges. And we can create a whole bunch of these and bring just these back to our manufacture site. And then we can start the indirect percussion process to finishing it. So you could very well find something that looks just like this and say, well, that is you know that's a finished out point the rather crude where realistically this is nothing more than an archaic stemmed preform at this particular stage and of course this is heat treated Florida chert. So now when we get back you know to our manufacturer site then that's when we're gonna have our couple of options and I'll show you using both one the very large antler flaker and then one of course using the more compound tool and I imagine that both in different times would be utilized perhaps even during the same times just giving different resources and available resources and if we pinch this underneath our leg as we squat and we can really tighten that up we can maneuver this thing around very easily and then by taking a very simple wood mallet set up our platform or set up the the uh, antler bit if you will on the platform and then drive these flakes off and it's a much safer method to percussion because we can be very very direct on where we place the antler bit line it up get the angle that we want and then drive the flakes off and they come off very very fast you can't even honestly you probably can't even see them but it's a very very efficient way of removing flakes let's see if we can see this you can see grab a pointer here I think you can see this flake that we just removed right there you can see the fresh removal from that so it's a very very effective method for removing flakes with less risk to direct percussion where we may stand a higher chance of breaking our piece in half. 
Another beautiful flake run right next to that one. Wonderful flakes. You can see how deep those go into the point. So then of course if we don't have that luxury of having the compound piece, and that's very easy to build. It's extremely easy to build to just say, we take a, a simple rock drill and we drill this out and simply take a piece of antler, grind it down and force it in here. There's no glue, there's nothing fancy. I do wrap the end with sinew to simply keep it from splitting, but it's a very, very easy build. And I think that that's probably good going to be a lot more common overall than just simply using a large uh, deer antler just simply because the availability of the very very large ones. Of course in this period of time we have to assume that they're we're probably likely growing pretty good sized antlers compared to what they are today being the fact that they probably weren't being as killed being killed nearly as often or in the same frequency but that could obviously be debated as well. So then you have your two different options of your indirect flake removal. And then of course we can refine things even further with just a simple deer antler flaker. And this is gonna help set up platforms as well as drive off some smaller flakes. But see, we can't run these great big long flakes with, with just this antler tine by itself. Well, we need a little bit of percussion involved to really drive those beautifully long flakes. We can get some nice flakes with this, but usually no more than oh, maybe three eighths of an inch on average, or even a quarter inch perhaps on average compared to the indirect percussion in which we can oftentimes travel to the center, if not even past using indirect percussion. But we can use the antler flaker to set up our new platforms, mostly crushing the edges into the shape that we're looking for, and then use the back side to just kind of roll and grind all the loose edges off. And then take our indirect percussion stick again. find just these perfect little platforms and then run these absolutely long beautiful flakes let's see if we can point that one out so you can see long beautiful flake right here running all the way to center and that we cannot do with pressure flaking alone and that is very very apparent on casts of original artifacts that you can see the, the much longer flakes that are being run to center on this that we were not able to do with direct percussion, but we can very easily do with indirect percussion. And so this is a point in the build that we're not necessarily trying to be super fast with it. Now we can be a little bit more direct in our approach, check our angles, drive these long flakes, and start really trying to finish out the point. At this point in time, there's, there's no rush. finishing off some of these and some of these we're getting some beautifully long actually broke the corner off it there a little bit these beautifully long you can see it's a complete overshoot flake done with indirect percussion starting on this side it ran actually kind of broke our ear off the other side but that's not that big of a deal we'll just clean that back up and fix it sometimes indirect percussion works a little bit too well if you know what I mean grabs a little bit too much of the rock. Another beautiful flake there removed. Beautifully long flake removal from here all the way across center even at an angle. So then we start moving into the final shape of creating the stem and we can start using the pressure flaker to raise a couple of these platforms very, very gently. And then we can align these right on the antler bit, 
check our, much like fluting but not nearly as dangerous, start checking our angles and then start running some of these much larger bulbous flakes as you can see right here. Perfect angle I believe where you can see what the indirect percussion is able to remove as opposed to just very small short choppy flakes that we are going to get from from pressure flaking alone. Now if the cross section of the point is thin enough that we can pressure flake then there's no reason not to. So that's where you're going to start seeing some of the pressure flaking taking place like this when you have a nice thin cross section especially if it was already done with indirect percussion and you can get a little flaker in there but you can still oftentimes see the remnants of these big bulbous flakes from thinning this out with indirect percussion so you won't necessarily always see them finished out with these bulbous flake removals from the indirect percussion on either side but there are some artifacts that you will see specifically that are finished off with those on either side. You can see the remnants over here from that same process happening. Now we'll finish out this side and we'll see how it looks after that. And then we'll also thin this base down. I'll probably do that just now, just a tiny little bit, although it doesn't need very much work at all. And we want to be careful not to break it. So we could probably just use pressure at this point and clean it up. That worked very, very well. And now let's go ahead and finish out and you can see if this one does I think we can might be able to get one more gentle one right here in this corner maybe one or two let's check it out see what we can do there we go so that was a little easier for us to reach as opposed to just pressure flaking it alone. So there's another one of these bulbous flakes that's yanked out of here. And that again, even though we'll do some tiny pressure flakes around it, that will still be evident of the indirect percussion even after the point has been completely finished. Even though we touched it up with the pressure flaker. And we can also take our very small flaker at this point. A little bit of tiny cleanup work, but not a whole lot. We are going to taper the, the tang just a slight amount. There, so that's a perfect example yet again of how we are able to remove all these little flakes, but you can still see the evidence of the indirect percussion in the corner in which we would have not been able to do that with direct percussion because of the steep corner and I can't remove that big of a flake with pressure flaking alone. So now it's just about cleaning it up so it sits nicely in the haft and then we'll also take our little tiny flaker and we're going to go along and just just clean up the edge to make it sharp. Very 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 light serrations on these Noonan, some showing some serrations, some not showing serrations at all. But also keep in mind that even if you do not serrate a point upon making it, you may serrate it once it is ready to go out on a hunt. Now your Noonans in general are not heavily serrated points like we see many other styles being. And that could be for any number of different reasons, especially because I do believe that this is an an expedient style point. We can create these very, very fast. I don't have very long wrapped up in this point at all whatsoever. It's very simple to produce, very simple to haft. Speed is kind of the game when it comes to these stemmed points. It's about just being fast and efficient, and especially if you do tend to be dis dispatching animals that are caught in snares or other sorts of traps or drives or cooperative hunts you don't necessarily need these very 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 well made points although some of your Noonans are of course very very well made but they don't have to be perfect if the animal is stuck in a snare and hunting on the ground with atlatls is of course 
very, very difficult on deer sized game. So here as we've cleaned that up, again it's not heavily serrated but it's just enough to sharpen it up. And that, I believe, is a very nice example of a Florida chert heat treated Newton point. So I think we were able to produce a quite nice little Noonan point out of heat treated Florida chert. Beautiful cherried up color on that. Did that with our antler tools doing mostly direct percussion with the freehand billet as well as the indirect percussion and got our little bulbous flake removal like we like to see in the corners of the stems and then also the long flakes running across it and then we do uh, kind of standard to these do end up having more of a little bit of a flatter side here and then more of a convex side on one side it's very slight on this point um, but it does occur and then here is an example this is an, a, an original artifact from a friend of mine James Berry and of course the ear is broke off on this one again made out of a Florida shirt of some sort. We thought perhaps bay bottom for a while and it still may be but it is a little bit dense to be bay bottom shirt but found kind of down in that area and what we can kind of see on first glance is that there are a lot of obviously similarities and of course they're not all made to exactly this size but as we inspect a lot of the corners we start seeing that indirect percussion flake removal in the corners of this as well. It's not quite as predominant but on this side, especially on the casts of the point that I have, you can actually see that there are some very large flakes that have been removed from these corners as well. So I think we did a pretty good job overall on our recreation of this archaic classic Noonan stemmed point. In addition to this video, we also have a book that covers a lot more of the data and specifications of this project not necessarily shown in the video. But if you head on over to HuntPrimitive.com or check the link down in the description, you can find this book along with a hard copy DVD of this video that you're watching and also a full cast kit of all the artifacts and recreations that we made, used, and hunted with in this Noonan project. Getting way too low. Seemed like it went in there. Point came right off immediately. Yeah. But reality is it hit low, but it slides right through the rib cage. So yeah, it doesn't have to be a yeah, cut a rib completely in half. Really? And still penetrated plenty fine, so Probably not a big deal at all. So it looked low, but there's actually it's got plenty of uh, it's got plenty of space left in there. Yeah, and it's fine. You could just shove that point right back in here too. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's what that's what the goal of it is. It's in there far enough that I can't feel it. So that I mean, kind you got of blood all the way to right there. Yeah, here, bring it over here in front of the camera. We'll show. It. Yeah, it, it went in every bit as as far as it needed to. To have killed it, it kind of did exactly what it was supposed to. It didn't over penetrate. Yeah, it didn't come out, but it went in and. So yeah, I thought I hit the ground, but I didn't. Yeah, I can't reach in there with a finger, but it severed a rib completely in half, at least one. I can feel both sides of it. So, in my opinion, yeah, if, I mean, on a deer, you want to hit them there. So it was just a little low, but that's what a, that's a heck of a hole. If we can see that. All right, so actually, it did come out the other side. It wasn't angled like that, so we're going to put it back on and do it again. So it did come through, and the point's perfect. So what we're going to do, take a quick mosquito swap break, and we'll stand it back up. And then what I will do is get just a little bit of pine pitch, and I'm going to stick that right back in. And then we can take another throw and hopefully hit it a little bit higher and uh, see if we get the results we want. But, I mean, point's flawless, so let's do her again. Perfect to see what that one does. Extra light's good. Didn't exit, you want more light? 
Um, yeah, it was actually good. Okay. Yeah, because it blocks out my shadow a little bit. Okay, so we got this much, and this is a pretty, this pig's bigger than a deer would be. And the point just now detached, so that that is exceptionally long. We'll measure that, I'll hold that and measure it in a second, plus the edge of the point. So that penetrates plenty, plenty far. And when we skin the pig, we'll look at the uh, wounds to see what uh, what we hit as far as ribs and that kind of stuff but to me that's a that's a perfect amount of penetration for this for this test and it didn't exit the other side which is actually kind of the goal yes all right so we're looking at seven a little yeah just about right at seven inches uh, and that's not including the point itself and actually if you know if you include the point which i don't know two and it's probably almost about 10 inches of penetration so it probably would have poked out the other side of a deer, a Florida deer, which of course is what we're trying to model it after. So just remember he's, his body's or her body's a little bit bigger than a deer's is. So seven inches of penetration, uh, not including the point. Uh, this is the, yeah, in touch screen if you have to, it works. There. So this is where the Noonan point went through. You can see this rib is completely severed and this one is about half or a third severed. Um, pretty much no damage done to the point um, and then down here is the one that went through uh, almost kind of the breastplate but where the rib attaches and we have a rib that's completely se severed here as well so but we got sufficient penetration both times there you can see the rib severed so su sufficient penetration both times and uh, yeah and we recovered the point in it and you know still actually has quite a bit of an edge there's a little bit maybe of edge damage from from the severing the ribs but otherwise it's completely perfect uh, I don't even think that it really needs resharpening it still has quite a good edge although if I was personally going to reuse this for a hunt I would probably chip a very slight refreshing edge on it So these hunts are taking place over the course of a couple weeks, and so we're not hunting a couple weeks straight, but we have probably eight or nine days that we have invested into these hunts, and we are in a very game-rich location. Now these wild pigs are completely wild, there's just simply more of them. We are on private property in South Florida, and it is a very, very large working cattle ranch. And so these pigs are able to completely come and go freely from this property. And they're, while they're completely wild, there's simply more of them. And they are less acclimated to being hunted like we would see on a lot of our more modern public hunting lands. So this is giving us a, a little closer analog to perhaps what primitive men would hunt as far as having larger game populations, more opportunities. And why this is important is because we have to draw the correlation. As you see these hunts take place, we come to realize that this is a very, very difficult way to hunt. And if we were hunting on modern public hunting lands where the hunting opportunities or the, or the opportunities to make a kill are so much lower, then it is not an accurate depiction of what primitive man would be hunting. So certainly, if it was a much, much more difficult place to hunt, being that there was fewer animals, they were harassed more often, our opportunities would be less, and that would not equate to, hey, primitive man wouldn't have been able to go out in these circumstances and readily feed themselves. But because the very large expanse that these animals have to cover, and there's a lot of these animals, we are able to get oftentimes anywhere from one to three stocks per day in this location. Of course, we are covering miles every single day on these hunts. So this should be a little bit more similar to the opportunities that primitive man would have had, but it's still important to be able to paint the difficulty of hunting with the atlatl even in a game-rich environment. So there's a few pigs out here ahead of me and they're distracted by feeding doing just what they're doing and I'm able to move up really quickly because the one's head is in the brush and it can't see me. The one that you can see a little bit better is facing directly away from us and so in the situation we've learned you just you have to get there and you have to cover ground really fast to try to get into range and then just simply hope that it works out. The second these pigs see you they're going to be gone.
should have speared the little one. You should have speared the one at the ankle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a mess. I'm gonna go back to where I found the spear. What it's like. Was this where I was digging around looking for it? Mm -hmm. or? Was it here or over here? Do you remember it all? Pretty Maybe sure it's right there where quick. the digging is. I mean, that's a fresh dig spot, so I probably did that yesterday. Yeah. I mean, it's possible it could have flipped out further, but probably not. It's probably right in there. <gasps> I found it. No shit. Yes, I did. I hope you got that on camera. It's all on camera. <laughs> looky there, looky there. Is it focusing on it? Yep. Look at that. So it broke the stem off. And when I found that spear, which we didn't record at the time because we were chasing pigs, we didn't record it and it had, I found the spear but without the point and I was like, oh, I lost the point. And then I looked inside it and the tang was broke off. And that's really archeologically important because what these Noonan points or Marion's or any of these stemmed points, they find a lot of the broken tangs, like say back at campsites. And then these are just like random finds places because my theory is they would throw them and they would snap off at these tangs and they would carry the tang with the spear back to camp, heat it up, which is exactly what we did, pull it out so you could put a new point in. And that's exactly what we did. We were in a rush still hunting, so we just kept going. And here we are, found this. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this home and I'm gonna chip the base down. Normally when we think about like resharpening and refacing a point, it's where, oh, we broke it in half, so we're gonna put a new point on it. But in this scenario, what we're doing is we're taking this, this point and we're gonna actually chip it in further and make a new tang. So I can put this stemmed point right back in another spear shaft. So, I mean, that's pretty darn cool. So not only did it break coincidentally, completely as we theorize, but we found both components. A lot of times you would leave this. I wouldn't have come back for this unless it was important to me. Like, cause I just go home and make a new one. So it's not that big of a deal unless my resources are really low. But for the most part, I would have left it. And I was like, you know what, Vastin, we should go back and look for this because we, did, we do have the stem. Now what I can do is if I refine this, I can actually show reworking this down into another point and then I can cast that point and I can show you this one. So it is pretty important to recover this kind of stuff. So that's pretty neat. So I'm gonna take this home. Like I said, I'm gonna rework it, stick it on a spear. We're gonna come out and hopefully we'll actually connect on the hog and kill it next time. So we learn a little bit every time that we do this. All right, so we have one of our, the points that we broke the stem off of on one of the missed throws. So we bring that back, we're gonna put a new tang on it. And what I actually did was I made a copy, a cast of it, of course, and I actually cast both pieces. This piece remained in the spear. We brought it back to camp, we heated it up, we popped it out, and we have both pieces. And so having both pieces then, and they're cast, and that'll be included in the cast kit that comes with this project, if you get on huntprimitive.com and purchase it. And so here's the original, and we're gonna work you through today, putting a new tang on it, but we normally see points that are reworked or resharpened, normally our mind thinks that they're worked from the front back. And we assume that just simply because a lot of you say your earlier paleo points or transitional or even notched archaic points are likely not broken often, not always, but often from the back and may suffer impact fracture or tip snapping and they're simply re reworked from the front back. But in the case of the stemmed points, what we see is very rarely, in fact, no times at all in this study, have we suffered really any tip damage, anything other than just slight dulling of the sides that we can sharpen back up very easily later, but not suffered any tip damage. Now, I'm not saying you can't accidentally knock the tip off one or break it on a kill, because you certainly can, and that might be why some end up having a little bit more around or bull nosing on the tip is perhaps you break it off and it just, you don't sharpen the sides completely down to match it, but rather you just put a new edge on so it ends up creating more of a rounded front. 
but the backs break off with such frequency that when we're seeing, if we're talking about a longer noon end, it keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Realistically, it's probably just getting a new stem put on on a more regular basis until you're down to you know hardly anything left but just the tip and a little bit of stem sticking out uh, because it's been sharpened from the base forward. All right, so now just in working a new tang on our broken point, I'm gonna start by knocking off the kind of the broken flat section because that's a natural platform that we can just get on and chip that flat section off. You can hear summertime coming in in full force now as the cicadas are exceptionally noisy. And so I'm just zigzagging back and forth. You can see I keep flopping the point over. And zigzagging that, that flat section off. So now you can see we completely eliminated that flat broken section. Now, go ahead and just kind of freehand nap these edges off just because they are a little a little too steep to just simply put a straight new tang on without thinning the, the back down a, at least a little bit and of course we don't want to get crazy doing this we end up snapping our point in half we do want to remove a little bit of material. So there we go. So we took the extra ears off of it. And now we're going to almost flake and crush the new stem in ever so slightly. So the process of re-stemming one, as you can tell, is not uh, incredibly difficult. And in fact, even after all of that, the edge is still sharp. I don't plan on really touching the edge up at all. I'm just putting a new stem on this. So back and forth, clipping it off. See where we're at thus far. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch right back to our indirect percussion once again. So we can really get in there. And develop that stem a little bit better. It's a lot easier on our tools and our joints as well. Set up a new platform. Just like that. All right, we've got one side done, and we're working on the second side. You can see.
All right. And as you can see, that was about a less than a five minute process. Start to finish, putting a new tang on a broken point which erased all evidence as well that it was ever snapped to begin with. Now it just looks like another noon and just a smaller one. And that could be debatable if that was an artifact and it was found that it was simply either A, built to these specific dimensions from the word go, or potentially even sharpened down in the front. But uh, you see how easy is it, it is to snap a tang off and just nap a new one right on in less than five minutes and we're ready to hunt again just that fast. A little bit of varmint control. Unfortunately, we didn't get it on film, but it worked so good and passed through on a little coon. Didn't take much to pass through, but he didn't make it out of the pond. I really wish we would have got that on camera, but it is what it is. We got just a little bit of daylight, so let's we'll come back for him later. I'll probably make something out of him. He's actually young enough. He's probably pretty good to eat, so we'll come back and get him on the way out. We're gonna. It's getting dark, so let's. Go. Ah! again as we put a stock on this pig nearing dark and it's facing directly away from us laying in a wallow and as you can see just as I throw the paradox of the spear unfortunately timed where the tip was facing slightly up and the spear flexing down just as the pig rose and the spear glanced harmlessly off its back hi Well, that's in skinning my little atlatl coon. So I'm going to put my point back on my spear. And he's going to skin that. We're going to... He's probably going to cook it. I think he's a better cook than I am. So I'll give you an update on that here in a bit. But I wanted to show you the point. And interesting about these Noonans. Let me get this thing lined up here a second. Alright, so there's our Noonan we speared the coon with. And to find the way that it goes back in proper. And it'll literally slide right back in if it's not too messed up. So the point was just broke loose, but the pitch is just just slightly tacky. And look at that, you can't even tell. You can see the fracture line there. But other than that, it's actually quite sturdy. So it's perfectly fine. See, I can actually push up on it a little bit. Not a lot. I can work it back out. See, i got to work it to get it out. So just by seating it back in here, it's ready to spear again. So that's really neat about it. And then, of course, once you get back to camp, like we are here, all we have to do is reheat the stem of that point and then work it right back into it, and that will reseat the pitch. Alright, so we see how it fits back in there just perfectly. So if we needed to just go hunt with it like this, we could. Or we could shim it with a piece of grass if it fit a little bit too loose. That would get us through the rest of the hunt. Or we could take another point and basically shim it and work it down in. But now that we're back at the modern camp, and of course, if we were out in the field doing it, or obviously it's dark, what I can do is just heat up a little bit more pitch. Definitely cheating with the lighter, isn't that funny? People aren't used to seeing me do that. Okay, now I'm just going to heat the whole stem of that point and that pitch a little bit right here at the tip of this. And then this. Then we want to make sure we find the same way that it went, which was just like that. Squeeze that together. And hold it a second and then lick your fingers that are covered in coon blood and wipe that clean. Stick it back on our pitch block and once that is cooled down it'll be completely ready to go again. We don't have to do anything else more than that. It's that easy. So that's what's really unique about the the stemmed point technology is being able to 
pull out a point, either the same one or a different one, heat it up, add a little pitch, and stick it right back in. So as this stalk unfolds, you'll notice that there's quite a bit of foliage between myself and the pigs. And in fact, right in between us is a very tall stalk of thistle. And you can tell by my reaction after the throw on this that even I didn't know what happened in the moment because I felt like I was really on on the shot. I was concentrating on where I wanted, wanted to hit and where I was trying to deliver the spear. And I felt good the whole time through the throw. Yet, while the spear was on its way, whether it simply left the atlatl a little foul or it simply paradoxed into it, I am not quite sure, but you can see the tail end of the spear hit that thistle stalk and deflect the spear down into the ground. And these are the kinds of things that just occur during these atlatl hunts, where an arrow would have shot right through that without any problem because of the small amount of paradox, we li likely would have had no problem whatsoever, but the atlatl po poses so many more difficulties than bow and arrow hunting, and this is just one more circumstance in which this hunt did not work out. So what is unfortunately not represented well in this video is the amount of time allocated to hunting. So we don't get to see every failed stock, all the hours and days and miles spent on these hunts. You're essentially getting the highlight reel of close calls, misses, and then inevitably a kill as well. He was gone. He was gone. Did he bury that one too? I, well, he was just gone before. I was mid throw and he was already gone and it's just like I just dumped it. Dad. Did that hit there? I don't know. I don't think so. Another one of those situations where when we missed, it broke the tang off. Of course, so I, I dug this back up out of the ground. <clears throat> but the tang is buried up in there. So of course we'll heat this up like we did before put a little stick in there and pop that out and that's why you're going to find but you can't really do that here while you're hunting it's stuck so we'll just take this back to camp heat this up and that's why you're going to find a lot of these little noonan bases all around the camp and then these are going to be this one again will just be reworked to have a new base on it and we'll put it in continue to hunt again He was gone. Whatever got there. He was straight gone. And that's exactly where he was standing. He was straight gone. I mean, it just doesn't get any better of an opportunity. Anybody that can't grasp how phenomenally difficult it is to kill them. Like with a bow, that one was done because the arrow gets there so fast. Would have been absolutely done. It didn't see us, but it saw the motion. Even though its head was partially obstructed, that dart went exactly where it was supposed to go. And it's just this, you have to give people that hunted with this stuff so much credit because it may look like it's easy, like especially when I go do some of these hunts and you just see that I killed the animal. It looks like, oh, it just came right out to me and I killed it. But you don't see the dozens and dozens of frustrating stocks just like this one that should have worked out and it didn't. And if it was with a bow, it would have absolutely worked. But, you know, we want to accomplish this. This is a lot of fun. It's very rewarding when we do it. But it's also extremely disappointing and frustrating when that happens. So, on to the next one. 
So it finally comes together on this situation where we have a lone boar all by itself. The unfortunate part is, is it's out in the middle of a pasture feeding. Uh, Vaston stayed back and filmed from the tree line and the only opportunity I had for a stock and a very, very low percentage stock was to walk straight behind it while it was feeding, making its own noise, and it was preoccupied with whatever it was rooting and feeding on. I was able to come in straight behind it, get into position just in time before it turned so I could throw. Now what normally happens is after you throw at a pig or shoot at a pig, whether you hit it or miss it, typically it runs off as absolutely fast as it can possibly go. And it either dies running or it will run itself all the way into the thickest, nastiest stuff that it can possibly find. But we didn't experience that with this pig. So I was a little confused at first as to why it ran and then stopped and stood there and then just seemed to walk and trot along not really in a rush to go anywhere obviously with a spear in its side and that was really uncharacteristic and so I didn't understand it at the time but that spear angled forward enough that it actually ruptured the pig's diaphragm and that essentially took its breath away or knocked the wind out of it. You ever had the wind knocked out of you then you certainly know how you really do, don't want to run anywhere when that happens. It's actually breathing quite well, surprisingly. I'm gonna go head it off. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead though. And so as he regained enough breath, he went and bedded down immediately in the closest patch of cabbage palms along the edge of this pasture, which is again uncharacteristic. Normally they'll go until they are in the thickest stuff possible, but because he bedded down into the closest little bit of cover that he could find, then we knew that it was a spear hit that was definitely lethal, and he would expire relatively soon. But Anytime I get the opportunity to sneak in to try to get another spear throw on an animal, if I can see it, if I think it's down, I'm always going to sneak into it to be sure. And as I come around the corner on this boar, I think that it's actually down and dead, but I can't tell, but I know that it's a boar, and I don't want to walk up to it, but here I am within 10 yards of it, it's not moving, and I can't tell if it's dead or not, so I decide better be safe than sorry and put another spear in it, rather than just simply walk up to it. So of course I put another spear in it, only to find out that it was still very much alive yet, and it got up, but it only ran another short distance, and then it was down for good. even when you do it with these great big points like this, which as I mentioned before, if, if you would have done this with right on the shield, quite honestly, I, I probably would have just bounced straight off. They're just not designed to penetrate an animal as robust as this, quite honestly. I mean, you're looking at, at deer-sized animals for the time period and the region that these things exist in. 
And uh, so I really I was looking for more of a sow to spear, so we had a, a little closer analog to or a comparison to that of a deer, but when you get an opportunity at a boar, you're certainly not going to pass it up. And uh, that shot that I made on it, it was a, a bit back for sure, but that's a, that's kind of like an incapacitating shot. I guess not an incapacitating one because they get up they get up and run off, but it, oddly enough, they don't want to go anywhere when you hit them. Then he ran all out, I don't know, maybe 70 or so yards and then went in and laid right down in some palmettos or right along some cabbage palms and uh, definitely made it another opportunity to get up and put another one in them quick just to make sure but got a little bit of a fight. I didn't realize that he does not have great teeth but he has enough he could have kind of messed me up so I probably shouldn't have done that. But uh, man overall I mean how incredibly difficult it is just, I mean, I can't even emphasize that enough because, you know, when you watch my videos, a lot of times all you see is, you know, the moment that it actually worked out. You know, and of course in this one, I'm going to make sure that I show people that there's a lot of times, a lot of times and a lot of frustration that it doesn't work out. And atlatl hunting is by far the hardest hunting that I've ever done. And uh, it's probably the best case scenario to have this pig all by itself because when you have the more eyes you have you get busted so easy and the only reason that we were able to get or I was able to stock in while Vastin filmed was because he stayed back and filmed that's why we were so far out because he would have been seen and I had to position myself to be directly behind this pig and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't and uh, it's a tough thing to do but I had to just move quick and stay absolutely directly be behind him and then I knew the second it turned it would see me and take off running so as soon as I started seeing that it was going to turn one way or another in that situation <clears throat> it's not something I always tell people this is how you do it but this is real hunting and this is the way it has to be done basically in this situation is as that pig's facing away and it starts to turn I'm basically throwing in front of its face the direction that it's going because every time if you watch these other ones when you throw and they see you they're gone before the spear gets there so I threw in front of where I thought you know in front of the pig and he turned and ran and it's still hitting back so that puts it in perspective at how fast even animals like this are and now could you imagine if pigs are this tough and pigs are phenomenally easier to hunt than deer could you imagine trying to spot and stock hunt deer with these it would pretty much be impossible. Did ancient peoples do it and kill deer? I'm sure they did. They certainly had to. They lived out here and they hunted with this stuff all the time. But the expenditure of calories to spot and stalk and walk around trying to deer hunt, you would run out of calories and die before you ever killed one. It would be such the fluke to kill one that way. So they may have climbed up in some of these live oak trees because if you do have a height advantage you can get a, a throw down and that's kind of a tough thing to do also. Uh, they may have implemented a lot of snare type technology where we make some some big cordage ropes and hang them over trails and put on a deer drive and as soon as one gets caught you run up with these things and you know you can't just run up and grab a deer it'll kick the snot out of you so you'd run up with a couple spears and you'd spear it while it's flopping in the snare and that's probably a, a much more efficient way of hunting you know with this type of equipment not so sporting more uh, efficiency in getting calories to eat more than anything but of course we like to spot and stock and make it a sporting effort and really I, I absolutely cannot thank Vastin and his family enough for allowing me to come down and spend in the weekend with him and we go around and bow hunt hogs and spear hunt hogs and there's not many people that would put up with you chasing around with spears and just failing and failing and failing and failing and he's behind the camera laughing right now because he knows it's true and he's just like I'm so tired of watching this not work <laughs> So, but man, I am very glad that this has been accomplished and I can finish the, this uh, Noonan project that we're working on and publish it out for, for everyone to see. So I want to talk about the animals living in Florida during these specific time frames of the stemmed points in the Noonans and even after they're being used. And there is a little bit of controversy in regards to whether there were elk or bison living in Florida. And I think it's safe to say that in different periods of time, we're talking a span of nearly 10,000 years, not necessarily for the stemmed points, but say even 8,000 years or 7,000 years, I think there were points in time 
where some elk and bison did start to move down into Florida, not necessarily in the large herds that we you know, expect from the American Great Plains, but more of some of your smaller herds that perhaps do move into the area and then also migrate out in different time, you know, uh, ranges, you know, could be a thousand years uh, amount of time that perhaps they start showing up or maybe even a few hundred years, or maybe it's just once every 20 years you get a herd that kind of moves in and, and then is hunted until they push back out or they just move out naturally. And I think that that is very reasonable to speculate, of course, and that is because we see that same behavior with elk and even mule deer today. In this very day and age, we see some places in which mule deer out west are not seen for 50 years in an area, never have seen one, and now all of a sudden there's mule deer in there for, you know, 10 or 20 years, and then they're completely back out again, and now there's no mule deer being seen in those areas. And it's not from overhunting, it's just simple ebb and flow of animal populations. And so there are some conflicting reports of people saying there is no evidence of bison living in Florida, you know, even as or as late as a couple hundred years ago. And then there are also some accounts, I can't put my hands on them. Uh, I'm not a historian, uh, a historic researcher in the regards of looking through old uh, Spanish documents, but there have been mentions that the Spanish talked about seeing bison living in Florida when they arrived. So whether that's true or not, I don't know, but why on earth would they mention that there was bison in Florida if there wasn't? And again, that's uh, kind of secondhand coming from what I heard. But I think that there is something that's very, very important to keep in mind, and that is that I think we can get a better handle on what animals were living in Florida simply by looking at the archaeological record and, and the time periods that you're seeing these stemmed Noonan points, most likely there are no larger animals outside the size of, say, black bear and white-tailed deer. So that this would be fairly well suited to hunting black bear and white-tailed deer, especially as we are describing throughout this video in potentially utilizing some traps and spot and stalk and ambush technology. Um, but this, from my experience, and I have a pretty big, you know, experience range in hunting big game animals, is that this is not a bison killer and would even probably struggle fairly, uh, it wouldn't do very well against an elk. I think you could, but this could potentially fail to penetrate a bison altogether simply because of the more rounded front and also the fact that it is very, very wide. So during these periods, we may not see many bison, but they may still exist. And the reason that we need to start considering those as options is because of points like this. And then, so this would be a Santa Fe or a Safety Harbor or a Tallahassee. All those three are essentially all the same style of point, very similar uh, time periods ranging from, you know, 3,000 years ago till even when the Spanish arrived these were still being implemented. And what this style of point is exceptionally good at with its very thin profile, very steep, sharp pointed tip is penetrating large animals. And this is extremely similar to the Daltons that were being used when bison absolutely were being hunted with atlatls and also very, very similar to the Daltons that I was recreating and which we used in the bison at Lattle hunting documentary a couple years ago. So this is extremely similar in size, shape, dimension, everything to the points that I used and absolutely prove that are devastating to use on bison. And then using these on some of your smaller animals like deer, uh, it's essentially overkill as far as penetration. And I think that's why we start seeing some of these because if you start putting these on four shafts and running these through deer, they're coming out the other side very, very easily. And then the points are lost very, very easily. And so then again, that circles us right back to the Noonan in which it was most likely used with this wider platform because it is very hard to sometimes hit a deer and also in traps when you have, or snares when you have deer that are flailing around it helps to have a bigger point in some occasions simply because you're hitting more and you're destroying more on those first hits. And 
it's easily replaced once it breaks. Again, we're just in and out. It's very, very efficient system where these are being hafted a lot more secure, much similar to the paleo points or the transitional paleo points where we're wrapping them around the base. They're hafted very securely. They're very, very sharp, very, very pointed purpose-built points for penetrating deep into large animals. So we do not need something like this to kill a deer with especially if this is actually going to work really, really good. So that may be a little bit of the understanding of what, why the animals, or what animals, rather, were living in Florida at this time. So this, these points are specifically found, say, from Tampa Bay north, mostly being in your north-central Florida regions, which is going to be very inland. Marion County, I think, has quite a few points of this style. And so that's going to be a very realistically popular area for some of your bison and your elk to just kind of migrate back down into and then also migrate back in and out very easily. You may be hunting deer and you know snaring deer or hunting deer and killing them with these and then all of a sudden when these bison do show up 20 years later you have people producing these and going and hunting those bison or hunting those elk and then as they move they stop producing these again and we go back to these or yeah all at the same time but the important thing to remember is you have to come look at this from a hunter standpoint if i have a bison that's over here and i have a white-tailed deer that's over here the bison is a much larger resource it's much easier to kill with an atlatl being the fact they are still quite quick but they are not as quick to react and flighty as a white-tailed deer. And so the white-tailed deer is much more difficult to kill with an atlatl than a bison. A bison has more resources. So you have two pros in the bison column and two cons in the white-tailed column. If you have bison and deer living in the same habitat, you are almost always going to be hunting the bison. So if we have bison and deer living side by side, then we probably have absolutely no reason to be making, hunting, and using these larger stemmed points that have some certain fail points and don't penetrate quite as far. I think you would see a lot more of what we see in the western states with smaller, sharper, real bison killers that were using the atlatl to take big game like bison and elk and potentially moose in some of your more northern areas. So a couple other really important things to talk about because inevitably we will be asked these questions is and uh, here's a a cast of the Noonan artifact it's just a white plain cast but <clears throat> some of the differences between when we're mounting to the shaft remember we talked about heating this and squishing it between two rocks and that it elongates the inside open tube of the cane which then allows the tang to just perfectly slide right in and then of course we take the pitch and we smooth this up and we wrap behind it with the sinew but what inherently happens fairly common is when you do heat this and you squish it down most of the time we end up with these splits or these cracks that run down either side and so we have to leave these we can't really trim the sides down but they are structurally compromised because they are actually cracked on the sides but by the time we wrap it really good with sinew all the way down it seems to hold together just fine so as we've gone out we've hunted with it we've hit the ground we've hit pigs we've had really very few issues with it if i have never split one of these but that is a slightly structurally compromised uh, side effect of squishing it is it does crack on the sides now something very similar to this to the noonan style points are going to be and i know that this question is going to come up is going to be more of a hillsborough style and you can see the differences where on the noonan we have a wider overall and larger tang and this the tang on this one the whole point in general is not very big but comparatively we have a much more tapered a very small tang on the hillsborough style which is loosely from the same same regions and time periods and all but most likely from speculation of course uh, a sub tribe 
or maybe even a rival tribe, it's hard to say, but using very, very similar technology with some slight differences. And I'll talk about this in a second. And another one that's very, very similar is going to be the Hernando. And the Hernando point in general is going to be actually a lot better suited for penetrating further. So when you take a point like this versus a point like this or the Noonans that even have some of the more rounded noses, these are designed to penetrate more without a doubt, like overall throughout the style. They're a lot more streamlined and pointed like we see with a well penetrating atlatl point. But the base is kind of unique in the sense that to somebody that's not used to looking at it, you think, well, we just put it in here and we're going to wrap it in. But keep in mind that these are these notches aren't the same as a corner notch or a side notch. These aren't going to hold the point in. And so what starts to make a little bit of sense is when you start using the same uh, hafting ideas as this, but with a little bit different, because what you're going to notice is, is if you flatten the cane and you try to put one of these in, it doesn't fit. And so this is very comparably sized to artifacts. And just like the Hillsborough, these small, if you put them in here, there's a lot of slop and there's a lot of play. And not only that, because it's such a small tang, there's just not much to hold it in there. It'll pop out way, way easier. So, um, <clears throat> very similarly hafted, a way to look at it would be this. And so this is the side that we're using for the Noonans. Obviously, I've already hafted this in here. You can see it's squished. It's elongated, wrapped with sinew. This side I didn't do, but I wanted to show you what I was working with. And you can see we leave the tube completely round, but we trim the sides down, and this leaves us with full thickness on the side walls with no cracking. So now we actually have a much more solid backstop for the point. So it is less likely to split. So in the grand scheme of things, these may actually be better again than the Noonans, which just kind of hurts my heart a little bit because I love a Noonan point, but it's probably true simply because there's no stu structural compromise on the sidewalls. It's left completely round, but then what happens is you can't take a large point and set down in this because the hole isn't opened up enough. So you follow me now, this still, if you stick this in here, it's way, way too sloppy. It doesn't matter what it is. So this is where we would implement what I would call a half notch used with a stem point. So what we're going to do is we're going to take on the sides that we still leave full because remember they're they're still full here all the way back. So even if we cut into this, we are still have complete solid wall behind it. It's not thinned. So if, if the point's going to actually lay, we'll use the knife blade as an example, it's going to lay like this. Obviously, if it was like this, you can see on the thin walls, it would split these really easily on impact. But like this, even if we set the point in, it's still going to be backstopped with these full walled sides, if you follow what I'm saying. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the stone knife that we normally do and we're going to notch this. But instead, and let me just bring you in and show it to you. So this doesn't take a tremendous amount of work. And I got this side started already. We don't have to go in very far. You can take the stone knife, wallow that out like that, flip it around the other side and we're going to get it started right there. A little bit off center, let me fix that. So now what we're going to do is we're only going to go in here the depth of the knife. So this way we're not trying to keep wallowing it out and make it a big wide notch. We're only going in a very, very short distance. And by doing that, then we are then able to have this half notch in place. So we don't have to do a big full notch where we wrap it around. Now what we can still do is just like we did on this side in which we wrap below the point, that's essentially all we're gonna do here is we're gonna go from the bottom of our little V cut and we're gonna wrap down with sinew here. This side's beveled in. And now if we take one of these, it'll slide right down in this thing perfectly. Now that side I did wallow out a little bit, so let me pinch it in there a little bit. And you can see how well that works now, see? So the little notches 
set down over the sides of the cane. And so then let's go ahead and look then too at the Hillsborough is going to do the same exact thing where now this sets in absolutely perfectly just like our Noonan did on this side. Very, very similar. In fact, to the naked eye, it looks almost exactly the same, doesn't it? Look at that. So it's perfect. So now, but now what we're looking at is a half shaft. And of course, that's not straightened out because there's no pitch in this. Is we'll pitch it in the same exact way. And even though this is beveled on the sides, we'll go ahead and we'll fill this in with our pitch glue to make that seamless transition, just like we would have with this if we do the seamless transition on the Noonan point. So now you can see that why it's important to have the small base on either the Hernando or the Hillsboro is because it's fitting into a smaller diameter tube as opposed to one that has been elongated that can accept the wider tang of a Noonan or Marion point. So we can wrap that up, we can pitch glue that into place and it's going to do the same exact thing and we do not have to take the windings off, we don't have to take the sinew off after an unsuccessful throw or a successful throw we simply pull the point out and replace it. Now one of the things to really important, this is ex exceptionally, exceptionally important to remember about this is why this is probably better again than the Noonan point overall is because you'll notice that we have had a lot of the Noonan snap off on this weak point and so in this study we have talked specifically on occasions where we miss hogs or potentially even hit them, miss animals in general, not necessarily hogs aren't historically correct, but in this particular study using hogs that the tangs snap off and leave the base and we bring it back. Well by doing a half notch and setting a small one in here you are much less likely because now it's supported up into the point slightly. You're much less likely to snap that tang off and have to bring it back and replace the tang. So it's almost what appears to be, and it may be because it's, it's similarly time-wise, but thus this does seem to be a more efficient way of hafting these points without continuously breaking the tangs off of these. So pretty interesting stuff to think about overall. I really like the theory on this, but again, a larger point not meant to penetrate terribly far compared to the Hernando, a variant of this in which it is actually meant to penetrate significantly further because it is that longer streamlined shape. So, so I think some of the major things that we learned in this project were a little bit about how the, the manufacture of the points goes, especially utilizing indirect percussion and freehand uh, billet direct percussion, but also the frequency in which the little stems break off inside the spears and that supports the uh, archaeological findings of all the little stems at these Noonan campsites but absent of the larger blades being that the larger blades are either left in the woods or they're brought back and they have a new stem put on them and so the little stems are discarded re-stem the points re-haft them and then go hunt again so that is a great little piece that we picked up from this and we were able to produce that very organically and then we also showed that the the broad width of these points coupled with a little bit of the bull nose shape does in fact impede penetration and comparatively when we use the, the spear, the same cane spear that we used to spear about 17 and a half inches through the heart of the American bison in the bison documentary project, that same spear using the broader Noonan point with the more rounded nose did not penetrate nearly as far. And so we can show that the differences between a broader, more rounded nose point versus the very thin, streamlined, very steep tip geometry style points of say like a Dalton or a Santa Fe have much greater penetrative qualities. And because of that, if they're using these larger, these broad stemmed points, then the idea of course would be to make a great big entry hole, but not exit the animal and then why that's again important as we discussed earlier is if you retain the point inside the animal it's not that the point's doing more damage while it's in the animal although that can happen as a byproduct but rather the point separates 
and the spear drops as the animal runs and we recovered all the spears we never had a single broken spear in this whole entire study which was great it was great efficiency in our spear resources and then also any of the kills that we made be it the coon or the spears that we put into the pig those ones all survived and had absolutely no issues in fact the only ones that we broke were the ones that we missed and they snapped the bases off which of course you don't really want to go out and miss anyway but as the animal flees runs and dies it's still got the point inside of it, just like that happened in our study, and, and even in the penetration test where once we clean the animal out and we're harvesting these valuable organs that are full of nutrients that we can eat, we're also recovering the spear point so we can haft it and use it again. It's a very, very, very efficient system of spearing the animal, the spear drops out, the point remains inside, and you retain both components so it minimizes the amount of work that you have to put into creating new components on a constant basis. Now, does it always work out that simple? Probably not, but we did show the plausibility of it and it actually is way uh, more forgiving on your gear than it is to simply have a four shaft that snaps and breaks off. So if you have that great cane resource, it's kind of easy to see why you would start leaning towards that stemmed point technology in this period of time. So I would like to thank you for following along with the Noonan Project and Adventure. And also be sure to check out the corresponding book and the cast collection, which covers many of the other things that we couldn't cover in this video. And that cast collection and book can be found at huntprimitive.com. And you can also reach out to me via email at twistedlimbs83 at yahoo.com. That's my personal email. If you have anything that you would like to add to this project. So if we can compile some additional information, we would love to drop down some notations on the website for those as well. So thanks for following along. We'll catch you on the next adventure.